And okay, so, go. welcome to Royal Path. This is all in. Um, I'm Andrew. I'm your host, and uh, we're gonna ask. Um, we ask the hard questions. What is your guys's karaoke song? I know what mine is. And it, don't do something. Don't do something like this weird B side from like Sisters of Mercy or something. Know. Like like do like like what's a club banger when you get in? Stay, you know you staying alive. Staying alive is mine. And That's I do it in the man. falsetto. You do it in the falsetto. I do it in the falsetto. <laughs> man, well that beats mine. Mine is uh, All Star by Smash Mouth. Oh, that's good. Because you know, that's like everyone's one. gonna get into it. Like even mm-hmm. even the like cold, cynical hipster at the back who's got mm-hmm. he's gonna be like at the end, he's gonna be kind of bobbing his head just a little bit. So completely unironic. Completely unironic. That's yeah. the goal. The goal of good karaoke is to shed irony. <laughs> you can quote me on that. Father, do you have a karaoke song? <laughs> yeah, I'm digging deep about it, as you can tell. Um <laughs> I've only done karaoke once in my life, so I could give the answer to what that song was, but it's not what I would pick, actually. What what, what was it? Uh, it was Welcome to the Jungle by by uh, Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses. Oh. Yeah. Um, That's a classic. That's a classic one. karaoke tune. Did you do it the falsetto? Yes, falsetto. You, you, hit the whole, you hit the high notes. Okay, yeah. I like it. <laughs> Did that whole thing? But it would definitely be War Pigs. If I could. That's oh. a good one. You could do it. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. That's, oh, that's, that's got good. like one of my absolute favorite lyrics of all time is like every time I hear is the Satan laughing spreads his wings. Like every time I hear that mm. line, I'm just like, ooh, ooh, he did exactly what he was mm. trying to do with yeah. that line. I tell you kind of a cool story. I was, um, I was in Bosnia. Uh, 2001 and um i was performing there in bosnia and um at the time because of the conflict there the the governments were alternating croat serb uh, bosnian anyways um at one point in time this was on my this is in my journey and so we were playing war pigs uh we we're doing a cover of War Pigs there, and there's soldiers there, um, both you know, mostly international soldiers. Um, and, and at one point in the song, I, I made the sign of the cross, and I remember a couple of the soldiers uh, in the in the crowd losing their minds because they're like, "Oh, I made his, they made the sign of the cross like orthodox." And yeah. It was, it was, <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was interesting. It was interesting. But yeah, it's like 2001, something like that. So that's my war pig song. Me playing in, <laughs> playing war pigs in Bosnia. So I was about to be like, "Yeah, that was a rough time in the Balkans," but you know, it was. Yeah, but you know, when was a good time? But good well, question. Yeah. Anyway. So all right. Is that, so, mo- is that moonshine, Andrew? No, man. Okay. No. It's some water from a Berkey. So <laughs> close enough. <laughs> exactly. Actually, I think that there's nothing probably more opposite to moonshine than water from a Berkey. Because then you have like true, the yeah. most polluted stuff you can drink versus the most not. <laughs> That's anyway. probably true. So last week we talked about we had begun to kind of dissect the Nicene Creed. Um, and so we discussed the patriarchy um, through its proper context, the image of the father and such. So um, I guess the next line of the Nicene Creed is uh, that I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Mm-hmm. So my first question is coming in. And of all things. <laughs> and of and of all things visible and invisible. and invisible well okay all right all right well yeah i thought we would tackle the, okay both visible and invisible Does heaven and earth right heaven being invisible heaven mm. being a place of meaning having being the place of you know origin in that sense of meaning with the with the source of everything is earth being that which is tangible that which is you know manifest right and so the 
the visible and the invisible heaven and earth are, you know, analogous um, correlations and representations. So it's important to complete it. Yes, of course. So and that's what we are, right? We are that connection point. We are the connection of heaven and earth because we are visible, we, like soul and body, right? That's what man is. Man is this composite being. That's what we, we don't have a soul and a body. That's what we are. So when you understand that, understand our function and our calling as that bridge um, par excellence, like even beyond the angels because they're incorporeal, right? We are, we are both. So heaven this is hard. This is hard for this. This was the big eye opener that you provided me father is that is is this this bridge this bridge notion i think i had had experience with i was very comfortable with the spiritual or the celestial and this sort sort of reaching out and maybe at a time being able to sort of journey there or something like that metaphor i was okay with but i i think the what what you really helped to shape for me and what I was hoping that we could talk about, and it was in the, the vein of the idea of powers and principalities. I find myself speaking a lot more about it as of late because people are saying, oh, what's going on? The only way that it makes sense, Cyprian, is the way that you've been describing it. The only way that any of this makes sense is that there's some sort of a higher order that's like the, the mm -hmm. structure of that is trickling down into our world and is like and is and is manifesting because if you try to go the other way i think that's where i had always been was to say like oh no things are happening here on the intellectual sphere and we have our psychological constructs and we have all of these things and then there is this other world there that we can go to and maybe they're looking and maybe we can get some advice from these things but to see the combination and the fact that we're bridging it is that was when it was like poof, my head exploded. And so that was what I was hoping we could talk about for the yeah. next couple of hours. Yeah. 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 It's um, I think we had talked about it before in regards to if I had mentioned what I'm about to mention, but it's um, and trying to suss out like why some people have bought into everything and why others haven't. Um, and it's not exhaustive, of course, but, you know, one of the things I think I mentioned, definitely maybe in, in one of our talks, one of our last talks, but definitely privately between you and I and, and, and Andrew and I, I think for sure we talked about it, but um, I find that those who have for a greater or lesser degree bought into everything, they're people who are um, either A, dismissive of the demonic forces. Um, they are B, um, dismissive of the demonic forces insofar as, you know, like for some Orthodox folk, they want to um, hyper intellectualize it and put frame it in an almost exclusively academic framework. Um, I think another kind of like subcategory of that are people who may acknowledge the powers and principalities and may acknowledge the demonic um, but their fear of the ramifications of what that means causes them to still be stuck on the kind of psychological level. So they will say like, yes, that's there, but it doesn't really have the influence in these areas like you're saying, i.e. health initiatives and politics and COVIDism and all that stuff. Um, so essentially in a nutshell, what I'm saying is the people who have bought into either A, the trick of the devil doesn't exist or B, that he's the good guy, you know, the mask that he's wearing and that all the stuff that's good and for your, for your benefit is not the devil, that it's really just well-meaning people and well-meaning authorities and structures and, and even some people being as naive enough as to apply Romans 13 where St. Paul talks about obeying the authority structures, applying that to the absolute demonic insanity that the world has been plunged into. These are the, these are the ones who um, are in a zombie-like somnibalance. It's 
I'm an out swinging. Yeah, forgive the Misfits <laughs> reference. <laughs> so, yeah. The, 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 the idea that this is, it's, I had a conversation. I'll tell you why this has been ringing in my head. I, I, I was having a conversation two days ago, had some people over at the house, was having a conversation. And the individual that I was talking to is somebody who, where, where this came up and where it was like ringing in my head. And it was very difficult for me to try to, to try to bridge this gap, even though I knew that it was there was this is somebody who like really believes in particular that like government is real. He speaks regularly about like governments and like how China is behaving and how Japan is behaving. And he'll talk about how the Republicans are behaving and he'll talk about how the Democrats are behaving or the left or the right. And I'm like, but then when I, we, we sit and we talk about Christ, <laughs> We sit and we talk about the church, then it's all for him, all intellectualized. Oh no, the church is just this like collection of people, and like it's not really real, and it's kind of like a social club and all of this. And it's like, no, I don't under, it's difficult for me to understand. You talk about China like it's a person. Mm -hmm. China wants this, China does this. You talk about the left like it's a person. The left does this, the left, but you can't, but, but the church, you can't do that. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, the church is a so it's just a social club governed by oh, the man. people who are in it as opposed to some higher thing. And it's just like making this is so weird because it's so common. <laughs> and I'm like, how does how can you not bridge that gap? Yeah. Can I just say something about that real quick? Because, uh, you know, one of the ways that the Antichrist and the way the Antichrists um, win people is that the power of the antichrist is 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 manifest so in other words they see the power the physical movements armaments you know administrative policies they, they mistake all of that for real power um and the power of the church which is primarily that of repentance is is they're blind to it so therefore since they can't see that the real power of the church is from for men for men to become from beasts to men and from men to angels they don't they can't see that they and they they can't see that that happens imperceptibly to those who don't want to see it so it's kind of like a a, a vicious cycle but ultimately that's why that's where that comes from because the the power of the church it's manifest in a way that they're they're woefully blind to so therefore the church is nothing more than a social club to them because a social club has no power to them it's like when you said certain priests were getting happy or whatever they were like um when they would do blessings like well thank goodness we don't have to do like we don't have to be like people kiss our hands anymore mm -hmm. because it's like not that you know and then you were like well this is the hand of christ but I like i mean i guess it's not at the same time because you're like being happy that people don't have to kiss your hand anymore when priests would give blessings. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, exactly. Because if that's where you're at, then like, yeah, you know, it's it's not that. You know, just like for people, it's like, well, you know, is it the body? Well, okay, never mind. It isn't. You know, just sure. that the second someone goes down that road, um, it's it's best to to you know not get infected yourself because trying to trying to engage someone who is so hard-hearted and so far removed from those invisible realities, um, it's not only is it, is it fruitless, it's, it's dangerous actually, um, because you can get caught up in that web of trying to like work through their machinations. Now, to be clear, then um, Cyprian of all people will, will understand this because there's people who are so far from the church, but the hearts are wide open. I'm not 100%. talking. I'm, not, yeah, 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 I'm yeah. not talking about those people. I'm talking about those people who sit down. And they're like, oh, dismissive attitude, blah 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 blah, academic, blah 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 blah, you know, YouTube philosophy, blah 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 blah, and that's like, you know, that kind of like appeal to like bad authority to just to dismiss. Um, 
those things that they find to be quaint or, you know what I mean? That, that's what I'm talking about, right? Don't even bother with them because if you try to work through those things with them, what you'll find is their unwillingness can actually um, pull you into, mm -hmm. you know, the mire with them. And mm -hmm. then it just, it's fruitless, you know, it's fruitless. So, but, I actually, but they, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead. But uh, I, um, I actually, I'm just going to go back just a little bit and vindicate. I, I was going to say maker of heaven and earth, just because the only reason I wanted to say that was to draw, try and draw into just like we just a brief aside into creation. So like, so yes, there, so there is the understanding of the second part of the, the, the line. Yes, of course. Well, I, I wanted to bring, because I've was a, for a very long time, was a very staunch believer in evolution. And it really only goes back to like in seventh grade, I schooled some kid in evolutionary logic. And I felt so awesome about myself that I chased that high for the next 20 years, you know? So that started to get some cracks in it one time when I would heard Father Turbo talking about and whether or not I'm not taking a stance. I don't really know how creation happened. Like, I believe what the church fathers say, and that's all I believe. So, um, but what I'm saying is, is that Father Turbo, like, this is not a hill I'm willing to die on. But what Father Turbo told me was that there's these like, old pieces of art and stuff like that, that depict animals or dinosaurs and man next together, like together, like there's no way that that really should have been. So anyway, I kind of, um, then he started to talk a little bit about what would happen if those beliefs of evolution really started to be called into question in a serious, where, where's, what's going to happen to the money, the money that's wrapped up in this, the careers, the jobs, the institutions, they're all wrapped around this tenant. So well, that's, that's very, why, that's very, very pertinent to what's going on right now in the world. So I figured that that would be a really cool thing to at least just spend a little bit on because the principalities, you know, the powers, you know, that's dope. Like, let's get to that in just a minute. But first, I kind of wanted to start a little bit just to make sure that mm -hmm. the stance is very clear. Like it, I won't go on, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter from the way I see things like how you view that narrative, the narrative of what happened at the dawn of time, you know, like what that looks like. And if you want to believe a certain thing, it kind of does meld that like Western rationalism, intellectualism with God and a little bit where you could take the stance of being like, well, yeah, evolution is just the way that God created people. And you can kind of like come up to that, but also then there's this other like, well, like, let's get really mystical with it. Like, let's, let's, like, let's take it, you know, down this other like trail of seeing like, maybe we really have no idea what happened. Maybe it's not the seven days thing. Maybe it's not the billions of years thing. So anyway, I digress. That's just like, I wanted to at least start with that. So. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Um, I'm going to throw out, it's not a safe word per se. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm loathe to use anything that would smack of a platitude. Um, but I'll just kind of throw it out there and we may need to refer to it from time to time. But uh, in Deuteronomy 29, 29, I believe it says that the secret things belong to the Lord but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever. And I think, um, not I think, I know that there are areas in which we can begin to peer into that it's, it's not a matter of, um, well, we do have no rights sometimes, you know, um, but I just think that there's a real danger that's you know, forgive me for using the word again in, in this conversation, that's imperceptible to people that when you begin to look into things without the proper kind of purification to really approach such knowledge, a trap, you begin to enter into a, a type of trap. So for instance, um, 
and if I get too far off on the tangent, somebody pull me back by um, right here. by I giving you. me the, the code word George Washington Carver. George Washington. Oh no. Um, I don't want to say that. All right. But uh, uh you know there is um there's a kind of understanding that when you encounter, let's say, like a demon, right? Like as someone who's demon possessed, uh, and you begin to actually engage that demon, nine times out of 10, you shouldn't do that. And the reason being is because um, it isn't just so much that the demons are incredibly shrewd and powerful and all that stuff. And they've been beguiling men for eons, right? But it's, it's also the fact that um, someone who is not in a position, again, through their own kind of, through a certain measure of purification of their heart and their mind, um, it's so easy to become twisted. I can't, I can't stress this enough. And so, Curiosity is one of those things that you'll find kind of, you'll find some fathers talking about it and, and the problem with it. And it's it's true because, you know, everyone knows the expression curiosity killed the cat, but curiosity and a certain measure of spiritual curiosity is really dangerous because there are aspects of reality that um, in our hubris, we think that we can, you know, boldly approach it and understand it. Mm. And the problem with that is, is that the whole, I mean, the world is an example of what I'm talking about. The world is diluted primarily because of the scientism and all of these other kind of, you know, philosophical machinations that people have fallen into as truths and they're not. They're not true. Um, their theories and the perspectives and their, they have beguiled people because society, Western society on the whole, lacked a measure of humility uh, that's necessary to really, you know, kind of engage the world. Um, for example, alchemy, you know, and the sure. fact that alchemy is, is, alchemy is the father of science as we understand it. You know, and I, I mean, that's kind of like my point. But look but, at the fruits. The fruits are so bad. The fruits you can just look nothing, over the last 18. These are rotten fruits, man. There's nothing but bad fruit. There's nothing but bad fruit. And I would submit, I would submit to you guys, um, the COVIDism is like the height of the, the kind of end result of it. Just the insanity, the absolute absurdity of it it shows how illogical and incestuous in many mm. ways the logic is of scientism, quote unquote, you know? It's just, it's, it's, it's literally absurd. People have been, they're spellbound. They're beguiled by a spell. We know yeah, this. Yeah, literally. But if you were to take the, the rigors and the, and the, and the kind of measures of, of quote unquote logic and science that people are using now, in 2017, 2016, people would look at you like you're crazy, right? They would literally look at you like you're crazy. Like, what do you mean? Like X, Y, and Z, you know? Um, and so anyways, you know, we're so beyond charts and graphs, right? Like, like it's, yeah. it's that's, that's the thing. But, but the positive side of it and what it looks like is George Washington Carver. You know, George Washington Carver asking, you know, George Washington Carver, who would speak to the plants and all this good stuff, asking God about, you know, tell me the secrets of like the universe. That's too big for you. Tell me the secrets about like the stars or, or whatever it was. That's too big for you. You know, he just kept asking. And then finally he said to God, well, what about the peanut? And God's like, that I'll tell you. And boom, it's like everything possible with the peanut. It's, 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 it's absurd how many things George Washington Carver developed and understood with the peanut because that's what I mean by if you're if you have a, if you have a measure of purification if you have a measure of humility if you have a measure of virtue if you have, if you have a measure of humanness to you and then 
that will that will cause you and help you to approach God in the right way. And then the, the mysteries of heaven, you know, may not be open to you, but definitely mysteries according to what you are able to bear will be open to you. You know, knock and it shall be open, seek and you'll find. It's very true. But the, the part that people are missing is their own disposition and their orientation, right? And that kind of gets us back to the father in regards to people's misjudgment of the father and like this very skewed and inappropriate perspective of God therefore leads them into this, like the atheism that we see now because God is this tyrant, you know, God, you know, they, they have their own projections of they're mad that their daddy didn't give them, you know, a Mustang or whatever the issue is. And they think that that's, they look at God as that way. And this is what the Luciferians do. This is what the Satanists do. Um, they have this same spoiled, petulant child's view of God. Um, but really, they, they don't realize that if you just humble yourself accordingly, you'll find that God is beyond generous. Just like, just like any father would be, you know? Anyways, I digress. Forgive me. You, you know, Father, it's interesting. Um, it's because this same conversation, one of the things that came up in this conversation, and it's now, now it's interesting. This conversation I had just a couple of days ago was 80s movies. And we were talking about the culture, how different the culture was, in that I was like, look, take the original Karate Kid. I said, you couldn't. If you want to understand the difference of like the guy I was talking, the guy that I was that, that I'm referring to is in his mid 20s. I said, if you want to know the difference in like worldview, go go back to like we had we had mysticism, like go back to the Cold War time. The difference between somebody in their mid 20s and their mid 40s, like myself, mm -hmm. it's like Karate Kid. The original Karate Kid, Ralph Macchio, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mr. Miyagi. I myself, said, you couldn't make myself. that. You couldn't make that movie now. You couldn't make that movie now. People would people would be like, the world doesn't work that way. They'd say, there's not going to be some magical Japanese man who's going to show up. And then, and this kid is not just going to humble himself and wax on, wax off and paint the fence. And inside of that, this man wouldn't be teached. There isn't that sort of wisdom. And it's like, what I told him was, you don't understand. For me, growing up at that time, that was exactly how the world worked. That was exactly, we looked at that and we said, yes, that's how, that's how I want to operate in the world. This is, this is how the world works. Like we did see the world operating in that way. And it, and it is that like, so for me throughout my life, when I would have mentors who would say, who would say things like, and even in my relationship with you, where there have been times where you've said that you're not ready for that. And for me, I'm like, okay, that means I'm not ready for that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. let me, let me, okay, right. then let me scale it back. Like, I'm not ready for that yet. Okay. What am I ready for? Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm ready to do the work to pursue and to get to that point. Right. Mm -hmm. But that isn't what is promised by scientism. Mm -hmm. Scientism is like, oh no, you're ready for the answer. And here's the whole answer. Here's the whole answer about biology. Here's the whole answer about gender. Here's the whole answer about, you know, justice. Here's the whole answer about all of this. And it doesn't matter who you are. You're completely qualified to, to get the PhD level. I'm just going to drop it all on you. And that's been the trick. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the things is that you start seeing the character, the villainous character of scientism and things like that because it's um it's so faustian right it, it's i mean literally that's you know faust, faust is part of the the inner mythology of how this all works right um do this and you'll get this right um or is promises. it Fauciism? hey the reaper Nice, right? Fauci, yeah, anyway, sorry. Uh, you know, promises of, of health. Like, look to see what transhumanism, look to see what, um, I mean, forgive me, you know, for, for, and I'm, I know it's kind of a trigger word for people, but uh, look what transhumanism, look at communism, it promises people. Um, to some degree, look at capitalism promises people. I mean, it's the same coin, right? It's like, it it's, you know, they promise utopia of some kind, right? 
Um, they, and everlasting life. And, that, and transhuman gives it, it, utopia, everlasting life, all of these things, um, moving beyond the limitations of what you are. You know, you can be, and, and, it, and it's, it's so funny because that message is the gospel insofar as the gospel is that God became man so that man could become God. And so God, through his love and his grace and his mercy, to those who would be his children, he makes us something greater and more. But the, the trick there is it's, it's love in relation to him. Um, and I think we might have talked about this before, but I'll just say it again, because it might be good, but it's just like, you know, there's a difference, you know, magic, sorcery, scientism, they're all rape. They're all a form of, of, of rape. Um, Whereas, you know, the life in Christ is union. Wait, expand on that. Expand on that a minute. Because, yeah, yeah we've I, talked about it, but I was, we haven't talked about it. It's, it's very it provocative. like you're on a roll there, so I didn't want to interrupt you. But, yeah, I have some questions. <laughs> Please, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, like I've said before, what's the difference between a scientist and a sorcerer, right? The sorcerer is more honest, hmm. right? He lets you know. He knows where he's, he knows, or he's at least more honest in, in who and what he's dealing with. Right, but magic is essentially with the K, right? Essentially, is in all of the you know hot topic var variations of it, Wicca and all that stuff. It all's lumped in there, right? Um, but it's essentially the the honing of the will and and the desire to subjugate reality to your desires. That's a that's the essence of what magic and sorcery is. Sorcery. I would make the distinction having a more pharmacological component, right? When I say sorcery, I'm using it in a much more specific sense in regards to the pharmacological component, right? And I'm sure we're gonna get some people that's gonna be like, black, click, 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 keyboards, you're wrong sure. because this obscure Edwardian guy said blah, blah, blah. I don't really care. I'm just telling you, that's what it is. So that is rape. The, the mechanics are the same. A man and a woman who are married and in love and in, in a, the sacrament of marriage, the mechanics of them coming together in a conjugal union, union and the abhorrent act of rape, the mechanics are the same, but they couldn't be further apart. The intent right? is different. The, the intent, the mode, are, they could be further apart, right? So this is important to understand because again, this is, this is always where people get stuck is that they don't realize that the devil is always trying to offer a twisted, perverted version of what God has promised his creation, right? Um, and so this, this forcing of self, do a stop whilst the whole of the law, dilemma, right? I mean, this is, right? I and mean, we can go ad nauseum into all the great, well-known, quote unquote, celebrities who, you know, um, I've heard, I've had conversations with some people will talk, you know, like, can we name names or whatever? But like, I've had conversations with some people they're like, well, X, Y, and Z, he doesn't really know what that means and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, why do you say that? Because he's a rapper that he, you know, is, is looking into the lemma and like, you know, all these things, is that exclusively to only, you know, kind of like middle-aged overweight white guys who are LARPing? Is that how this works? Is that, because if that's what you think, if that's what you think all this is, then like you're, you're really missing the point, right? Because um, I'll submit something to you which is very interesting, I, I, I find this very interesting, is that, you know, it doesn't really matter to the devils how authentic your system is. They don't, they don't care, right? It's not like, it's not like <laughs> they're disqualified because, you know, you started practicing quote unquote Wicca off of something you read off of a really bad, you know, uh, you know, chat board somewhere. It, 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 it's, it's, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. And the reason why I'm saying that is because 
what they're looking for are rights, as C. Paisio says. They're looking for rights. And they're looking for rights by which you are assenting to their influence. And the reason why they want that is because they're vampiric in nature. And that vampiric nature that they have is insatiable. And because people don't understand, it's dogs bark and cats meow, right? It's like, the na they, their nature is closer to that in, in regards of like animals because they are what they are now. Now they are, they are what they are. And any thought of them changing or something being different, that's why I, one of the things I love to, I just, it kills me is like people talk about white magic versus black magic. It's just, right. it's, it's so, it's, it's absurd. I know to them, it doesn't seem like it to them. It's, you know, it's a world of difference, but it's just an aesthetic. It's an, it's a difference of aesthetics. It's not a difference of the power that you're calling down. Yeah. You know what the difference is? Here's the difference. Um, there's, there's the guy who, uh, you know, he, he's waiting around the corner and he jumps out from behind and like grabs the woman and, and like starts beating her and like, you know, he kidnaps her versus the the date rape guy with the roofie like that's yeah. the difference between white magic and black magic yeah quote unquote white and black right like that's that's the distinction between the two right and so i don't know some people might even find the date rape roofie guy more, more abhorrent I, I don't know you know what i mean um because for me personally like god forbid but you know, I would rather have someone I know or a child or a young person I know who's dabbling with that stuff. I would rather have them like dive deep into the stuff than play around with like tarot and Ouija boards and like quote unquote Wicca and all that stuff because that stuff, this air of decency, this air of like, well, it has good intentions. That's a lot harder to undo because you have a way stronger chance of seeing them for what they are if you go straight in. If you're like, you know what, I know what this is about and I want it, right? Yeah, the subtle influence, I, I found that in my own experience was the subtle influence of playing around the edges, but then having, it, having the subtle influence over time was much more difficult to come out of than those experiences that I had where it was like focused and intention. And it's like, okay, I'm on it. Mm -hmm. And it, what this again goes back to this conversation because this, this sort of subtle, the, the subtleness of participation in the church, I think also in this conversation that I was having was this was a difficult, this is, I think a difficult place for, for certain people in in understanding that like the kingdom the kingdom is can be subtle and the kingdom can at times be like boom like on you like something major is happening but that's the subtle power of transformation mm -hmm. ha has been for me in my experience with orthodoxy is that it like that has yes i've had those moments of like crashing down on me you know what i mean and it's like whoa what is this but the, the subtle has been way more, what, what would I say? It's when I look back and I'm like, ooh, I really am changed. Like the, the subtleness is when I look back and I'm like, okay, maybe the experience, I, I felt the, the drip, 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 you know, of like grace. Mm -hmm. But that was like the truly the difference in terms of where I'm like, ooh, I am just, I'm, I'm different in a way that I can't even like, I couldn't even imagine going back was from the drip, drip, drip. Mm -hmm. It wasn't from like the, the heavens opening up and something crashing. Up. That was disorienting. Mm -hmm. You know, that was like, whoa, this is really happening. Like, wow, this is amazing. But the, the transformation is the drip, drip, drip. And it's like the fact that that's true on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. the, you know what I mean? Right. Well, again, I mean, I think it leads again to uh, love and, um, you know, God woos us for sure 
but he will he woos us as the most honorable of of, of suitors right and and he, you know what you're he wants everything he demands everything but you know that right you know what you're getting into when when you when you engage him in that in that regard right but it's a matter it's a matter of love and it's a matter of being gentle right it's a matter of a man on his wedding night who's coming on to coming into his his pure bride he's gentle with her right he loves her he's wooed her he he's looking to share himself with her and like i mean all of those all of those uh kind of like visions of intimacy and, and perfection. That's, we have those visions because God is, right? That, that's the only reason why I can have an idea of what it means to be gentle. I can, the only reason why I can have an idea of what it means to be truly intimate because God is. And so because he is, this is an echo of what he is. As, as weak and as crude as it is, nevertheless, that purity and that goodness, I, I'm able to perceive it because he is, right? Whereas on the other end, the bestial, frantic, frenetic, self-gratifying, like all that and that bestial aspect of it, it is, uh, it's, he's not that. And um, love is what makes the difference. Love is what makes a difference. Or I should say maybe the absence of love is what makes the difference, you know. Um, it's interesting too, because when you start to reflect about how um, fear is also a means by which people are seduced or, or I should say coerced into things now. Um, it's, it's pastorally, I've, I've heard so many heartbreaking stories of women and some men being coerced into things because of fear, right? And so that's, that's a different approach where it isn't as violent and frenetic, but it's definitely of the enemy. You know, and I think it's I think it's important to to understand that because this is part of what it means to have discernment, to know the difference between a good what what is of a good spirit and what is what is evil, um, and understanding these movements of things. Because, you know, getting back to this this thing about principalities and powers, you know, on the one hand, one of the biggest things that people you know when I try to initiate people into this kind of deeper understanding and you know quote unquote cosmology is that if you're thinking about the demons as the little, you know, kind of blackish, bluish, purplish guy sitting on your shoulder with bat wings and a tail, like you're missing it. But at the same time, if you don't see it to that degree either, you're missing it, right? It's like, it's both and, it's not either or. And the reason why I say that is because um, Part of the problem with a lot of boomers, you know, forgive me any boomers, you know, uh, who might be listening to this. <clears throat> you know, I, I talked to them, don't worry. <laughs> um, you know, they, they were raised with an implicit trust in institution. Just institution period, right? An implicit trust. And for some of us, we scratch our heads because we're like, well, hold on boomer, didn't you go through like counterculture and like, you know, the hippie movement and all that stuff but like the thing about it is is that like yeah they did but really they didn't do it in any real substantive way the mass of them because the mass of them 10 15 10 to 15 years later ended up just doing what their daddies did yeah and, and, and buying into everything else like there's those ones on the fringes who really meant it i'm not talking about them the vast majority of them they're you know i mean depending on who you talk to the whole 60s counterculture was a giant psyop anyways. Um, but, yeah. but definitely the principalities and the powers were involved with, for sure, right? For sure. And it was definitely one of the cogs that the enemy had put into place to really move society where it's at today. It was, it was an absolute necessary cog, both in the influence of dismantling traditional structures of family and morality, right? But also the kind of um, the inverse of that, which is implanting inherent distrust, right? All of those things were 
and genius in regards of getting us to where we're at today. Because on the one hand, you see the, the confused and duplicitous nature of it. You have people who will talk about, you know, Black Lives Matter and uh, all this other jazz, uh, defunding police and blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm talking like boomers, right? I'm talking like these poor deluded souls who are like governors and, and all these people, right? Superintendents, all stuff. They're like all in on this stuff, right? But on the other hand, you know, they're still just as much bought into institutions, still just as much bought into, I mean, the proof of it is, is again, the COVIDism, right? It's like what you think that you, you wanna complain about how the US government has treated black people, right? But yet the US government is okay in regards of giving experimental gene therapies. Like what? How does, how, how does that work? How, how is it you can trust on this one end, but on the other hand, you can't trust, right? So that duplicitousness, that's definitely a fruit from my perspective of that kind of counterculture experiment that the, a lot of the boomers went through. Like and, the counterculture created a, a safe rebellion. You can yeah. be rebellious and you can like, you can argue against these issues, but just these issues don't go too far. It's the same reason why like Rage Against the Machine and like the early days of COVID 2020 were like, sometimes it's best to do what they tell you, wear a mask and wash your hands. <laughs> right. And it's right. like literally like <laughs> you just killed anything right. I had for you guys. Like it's just, it's all fake. And it, as it's like then, has it all been fake? And it's like, well, probably a yeah. lot of it has, but it has. I mean, forgive me. I, I want to. I don't know, maybe because I had a really tasty energy drink. I don't know. I just want to, I want to really uh, upset and offend someone right now. But like, you know who I just have such a disdain for? Is the Rage Beatles. Against the Machine, me too. Sorry. Yes, Sorry. but the Beatles. The Beatles. Yeah. Right? Because the Beatles to me are kind of like the epitome of what I mean by this, right? It's like, they're so nefarious on so many levels. When you really start <laughs> pulling them apart, <laughs> you know what I mean? We really start pulling apart the Beatles and like, I, I mean, I could tell you guys a story right now. And I guess, you know, we could be, we could look at the glow of our screens as the campfire, proverbially speaking, but like, man, I don't even know if I want to go there. Cause I could tell you a story about a girl I knew who she in her own terms, her own, you know, she didn't use the term correctly, but she would talk about how she would try to hold seances with uh, the spirit of Lennon, George, uh, John Lennon and George Harrison. Uh, and she would talk about some pretty interesting stuff that would happen in this process of listening to Beatles records and trying to go into altered states. But the reason why I bring all this up is because that seductive invitation into these inner spaces of spirituality that they did are not innocuous. They aren't these, um, and, and, and that's part of why it's so insidious is that they present it as it is not innocuous, right? But like for me, you know, it's like I told this to, uh, I think I was talking to my son, as to my two, old, my two middle sons. But I was telling him, I was like, yeah, I'm talking about the Beatles. And I was like, well, Musically, I, I have more bands who I like that are influenced by the Beatles than the Beatles themselves. Yeah. But I was like, you know, the big thing for me is John Lennon's the biggest hypocrite ever. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, what do you mean? I said, like, man, don't ever tell me about love and all this and that. You abandon your kid. I don't want to hear it. Don't tell me about love and all this and that. And you've facilitated countless, you know, <laughs> moral and mental breakdowns for people you know and you so shall like, know them not, by their fruits you should you know, know them, them by, by their fruits. fruits you know by yeah. the fruits and i know people will go like well you're starting to sound like one of, you're starting to sound like a uh 1980s religious right evangelical who's blaming ozzy for people committing suicide it's like i'm not but if i am then i guess you're missing the point because yeah. you know like um ozzy's like you can you can almost like you could argue that 
the Beatles are far more nefarious because they are trustworthy. So there's like that subtle influence there because mm. like, yeah, Ozzy's peeing on the Alamo and biting the head off of bats during show or uh, or bats or whatever. But like, you know, that's, you'd almost- But that's who he, he always claimed to be that though. Mm-hmm. That's what I, you might as well just dive in if you're going yeah, to do it. To bring it back to what fathers. Now I'm not saying go listen to like satanic bands, but like, you know, there's this whole like, you know, like we said before, like the Antichrist is going to be a pretty rad dude. Like mm-hmm. he's going to be like, what's going on? You know, and like to have like four, you know, very cleanly cut, you know, boys from Liverpool to come along. And boy, I got to let Father Turbo talk because I could go on about this because I also really dislike the Beatles for a number of reasons. And I think that like, don't sit there and play Imagine, you know, on your life. Oh, the lyrics, the lyrics of Imagine are Antichrist. about <laughs> as Antichrist as you possibly get. Unlike, All you got to do is just read those lyrics. It's like, unlike the world's most like, like expensive piano like yeah. ever made like he's like sitting there like singing like imagine you know imagine there's no religion i mean forgive like... me forgive me I, one of the ways i for me i sum it up is like uh my dad hated the beatles you know i mean my just if people don't know who my don't don't have no not, know nothing about my dad but my dad uh my my dad was a cool guy and he was uh <laughs> the record store on gambling houses i mean he was you know by all those you know he was he was a dude of the street but my dad loved the stones hated the beatles right loved the stones hated the beatles and for me that kind of sums up a lot because i'm like with the stones you know what you're getting you know what i mean it's like nobody looks at keith richards nobody looks at mick jagger and go like man those are some stalwart blokes. You know what I mean? No one, <laughs> no one, no one does that. You're just like, everyone knows like clearly Keith Richards is still alive by the power of Satan. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah. there's no other way that, that that, I mean, he's so gnarly, his own blood poisoned him. Like that's right. But you know, Sir Paul, I mean, really, you know what I mean? Like that, like, the stones go ahead soup like you you know what you're getting you know what you're getting the beatles you know that they're the roofy guy you know Um, but this is the i think that this is the interesting thing about the 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 discussion regarding institutions and i think what where there is the blind spot and i think andrew that you you brought it up is that there's this there is this notion and i think that the boomers introduced this and it was perhaps and perhaps this is you could trace this or the beatles were a prototype of this that pre it it happened in a lot of different ways but certainly i think pre-beatles you had this idea of like here are the institutions okay and within the institution like the institution has a what would you say the institution has some sort of a dogma about it, where it says, this is right, this is wrong. This is what the institution stands for. And then something happened um, within the boomers where it was like, the institution itself bifurcated itself and said, okay, there's, it stands for this, but no, also within the institution is the ability to be a rebel within the institution. Mm -hmm. And whether this was in government, whether this was in academia, all of this, and I've seen this as being a gigantic trap. South Park even did kind of an episode about this, right? And I've seen that like, this is exactly what we have going on inside of institutions now. Like even, even as we speak and we have this whole Southwest Airlines pilots and all of that, and they're, oh, we're gonna, walk out and we're going to do it. And people are saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to help end this whole process. And it's like, no, they, the way that they're doing this, it's like, oh, they're taking sick time and they've put in a lawsuit and they're doing all of this. And it's like, no, no, no. It's all happening inside the institutional framework. 
it's all happening. And the institutional framework is the exact framework that allowed this all to go down in the first place. There have been no yes. checks against this. Yes. <laughs> like the, the institutions have allowed this to happen. And so it's like, no, 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 you just, you be the rebel with the inside the institution. And then when you're shut down, it's like, oh, well, I guess they were supposed to get shut down because they, because this is what the institution said, as opposed to, and this is what I've been trying to communicate to people is it's like, no, no, no. The kingdom that, that I am a part of and that I answer to is not inside that institution. It is, it is, it is its own kingdom. <laughs> and it is, it is right here, and I'm answering to that. Now, if the, so long as this institution over here is in line with what I'm supposed to be doing inside the kingdom, no problem. I'm with it. I'm not against you. I'm not going to fight you. But I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna go long. I don't have any responsibility to to air my grievances or to oppose what you're doing with inside your institutional framework. And I think that that's why it's like all of this seems like a trap to me, Father. And it's and it's like, of course, the powers and principalities. There's, of course, these entities are smart enough to know that that's how you set up the institution. They've been watching us. There's a, of course they're smart enough. There's this kind of gets us back to like this is a great kind of like forgive the cheesy direct plug but of like the real path right because um when i'm looking up here there's 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 a couple books that i think if people want to start wrapping their mind around this a little bit i don't know if it's a you know i'm just gonna throw them out right but like one of them um real pivotal in regards of kind of starting to deconstruct some of this in the right way like what you're talking about cyprian is by this guy uh william stringfellow and he wrote a work called An Ethic for Christians and Other Aliens in a Strange Land. Um, and in that, he basically, full stop, is like, it's all fallen. Full mm -hmm. stop. It, mm -hmm. It's all fallen. There isn't this kind of like, in regards of like American exceptionalism, right? Well, you know, and I get it. It gets into this whole like, well, what's, what's a healthy love of like, you know, country and patriotism versus uh, nationalism on stuff. Like I get all that. And, and there's validity to, the, to those arguments on the kind of psychological level. But if we're gonna get up to that level of principalities and powers, which is where we need to be, it doesn't work. It's all fallen. And I would submit to you that that's the Christian perspective. That's the perspective our Lord gave us. That's render it unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Like that's, that's our perspective. That's our cosmology. The whole thing's broken. The whole thing's fallen. Um, and that's also why so many people aren't experiencing transformation because they have a lukewarm, tempered, watered down approach to the things of God, right? Because it's still in that worldly institution. It's still trying to function. They want to have a Christianity. They want to have an orthodoxy. They want to have a spirituality that's still within the framework of that institution, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work. It, it neuters it fundamentally. Mm -hmm. it, it neuters it, right? You can't, you can't sit at the table of demons, right? You can't serve two, two masters, right? Um, so that's the first thing is like understand that it's all, it's all fallen and that it's not like, oh, things are going to get better. Like, no, 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 no. Entropy. Everything is, mm -hmm. everything is falling apart. Everything is decaying. And, and we are things on the, on the broad institutional cosmological scale. If you want to look at it are on the one hand, this is Gerard, right? Uh, Rene Gerard, like things are getting better and worse at the same time. Right. At the same time. Uh, but when you understand in, in which way those things are happening, then you get peace. Because peace, the peace I give to you is not as the world gives it to you, do I give it to you, as, as our master said. What does that mean? Well, what it means is when you begin to understand what we're talking about here and you begin to accept it, then something incredible happens. Then you're liberated, yeah. then you're free. And when you're actually free, forgive me for how this is gonna sound, but then you actually begin to taste what real power is. Because the power that the world and the demons try to seduce you into, it isn't power, it's just another form of slavery. Mm -hmm. 
but he but the master well, this is the, the the third temptation of christ in the wilderness that's right yeah that, that's right. that you get you only get the power because you bowed that's because right. you bowed down that's to the right. adversary that's right that's right there is only one who has power he doesn't like to share it so i mean well yeah that lord of the rings quote from that lord of the rings book that's what i was trying to say but i've been i've been zoning out for a while i've been just watching you guys so I came back in at a wrong time. But I had a question. <laughs> I did have a question. Yeah. So there. So at the beginning, we talked about. Uh, well, you talked about the spiritual and the material coming together, right? Mm -hmm. So. So this kind of takes this approach of like. Okay, so my my whole thing when I was anti-conspiracy was the classic like, well, look at people trying to merge onto a highway. Like you're telling me that like human beings can work in a way that actually like, and I know this has all been touched on, but I promise I have a point that, that there needs to be some X variable to make, to bring these people together in a glue to make them work, you know, in, in a certain fashion, whether it be an NPC or a willing participant or whatever. So is there a time at which like, it's fair to say that like, what is the level of involvement in a in a broad way of like the principalities versus like angelic powers of like the heavenly powers in government like i know that like yeah i'm the person trying to put out the garbage fire and when god comes along and says like hey look you don't have to worry about the garbage fire anymore just endure it and then we can go over here to this you know wonderful garden or whatever so that's that's relief for me to be like okay cool but like how much of that garbage fire is being put out by like, you know, heavenly powers, like at what, like, I guess what I mean is like, what is the level of involvement? What should we look to like in the, na in the daily news feed, quote unquote, of like angelic powers versus like demonic powers, like, because it's not really like safe to say like, oh, well, there's never really been a government that hasn't been influenced by one of these two things like that's this is the tale as old as time like literally so like um i used to think it was cheesy to be like oh well praise god you know about the abortion ban or whatever you know like oh well you know praise god or something like that but like there's an actual involvement of these two sides and i guess i wondered like from a more sober perspective probably than i can give what does that look like like how does that actual interaction play out and what's like the level of involvement like is everything one or the other or can you just kind of get an eye for what is in general speak in gen in, in generalities uh, it was a really good question take your time was it um <laughs> I mean, I think I really uh, held it there. So, so forgive me. Uh, okay. I think one of the things I want to say here is that um, I was asked a similar question in so far as it was more particular of, you know, how to respond to political movements within a context of like a parish or things like that. Um, and the I was on a panel with someone and, and um, the person, the other panelist answered it, you know, very well. I mean, very, very well. Um, but the problem was, was that, you know, I, I had, I didn't give a counter to his answer, but it was the thing of like, I'm going to answer this in regards of what I've experienced. Okay, so this is this is not exhaustive in the sense, but this is what I this is what I know because this is my experience, and I hold up any experience that I have that I share um, with fear and trembling as a priest in the light of. Does this does this line up and does this stand up to what I I understand of the fathers, what I understand of the life of the church? Does that make sense, right? Yes. So I'm just it's kind of a long qualification, but it's necessary, right? Okay, so here's the thing. 
Um, it's one thing to read a commentary about the liturgy. It's one thing to um, have speculations about certain things. It's another thing to see how transformative the liturgy is and can be both in the lives of individuals and territories. Hmm. The St. John Chrysostom, where there are monasteries, there are no prisons or jail, whereas the prisons are empty and yeah. hospitals are empty. Yeah, because, I mean, I, I've seen it both ways, right? Um, I've seen it where there is direct response to the amount or lack of amount of liturgy happening um, in regards of violence, in regards of, you know, a measure of peace as subjective as that is, right? Um, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get across is that um, we have the fearful and profound privilege of being ambassadors of the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. And the more we are aware of that with fear and trembling in all humility, the more that that grace not only can be accessed, but it's, it's transformative. And, and I, I mean that on a like cosmological level, like not just, not just in a uh, kind of subjective moralistic sense of people learning to, you know, appreciate high art and all that stuff and becoming polite. But I mean, the space around those who participate in the divine energies of God begins to change. Let me, let me give you an, let me give you an example. And I know you're talking about principalities on the larger scale of things with governments, but mm -hmm. like it's fractal. Like if I if we can talk about how it works on the smaller scale, then when we then it's a lot easier to scale up, I think, versus the other way. Okay. Because when you begin to share with someone a bridge by which they can kind of maybe get a glimpse of how maybe they've experienced it or have or have kind of come close to holiness, then they can understand that it's possible. And then from there, you can kind of scale up. Does that, that's yes. the approach I want to take, right? Yes. So, um, so some people know, a lot of people don't know, whatever, but I, you know, before being a priest, I was a tattoo artist and I had a tattoo shop, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the thing about my shop was that, you know, it was a studio, it was a shop and it was, uh, I mean, just to put it kind of simply, people would walk in and they'd be like, is this a church or is this like a tattoo shop? What is this? You know, it's, it's um, for people who know me, it's, you know, I have my own kind of particular taste in art, but there's, there was icons, but there was also, you know, um, the, the aesthetic was, was, was one of, was one that would be in harmony, let's say, with, with the kind of the, the high art of, of, of the church. Let's put it that way. Because I don't want to give the impression that was just, you know, set up in a certain way to look like a church. It's just, it was the nature of, you know, of, of me, right? So um, I had clients who were witches. I had clients who were atheists. I had clients who were all kinds of everything, right? And these clients, you know, uh, obviously before I become my client, they would, you know, not know much about me, but they would, you know, I was pretty much almost exclusively word of mouth. I didn't advertise, I didn't do whatever, right? And so, but obviously part of the thing is like, okay, turbo, blah, 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 blah. And, and I know, cause people told me they're like, yeah, and he's a Christian, like, don't let that scare you, whatever. He's a great artist, blah, 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 right? But the phenomenon I'm talking about is I just, I had it so 
often, I can't, it's just countless times where people would come in and they're just coming in as they are. But five, 15, 30 minutes into it, they start catching themselves. Like they're cussing or they're, there's just like some vile stuff coming out of their mouth about, you know, lewd stuff, whatever. And they'll be like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, forgive me. You know, they look around, right? I'm not sitting there going like this, right? I'm just, okay, great. You want to do this? You want to do that? What was that? Why did they all of a sudden start, oh, excuse me, right? It, it was, it was the icons. It was, they sensed something holy, right? It affected them. It affected them, right? In and a way was, that they couldn't have even articulated. They couldn't even articulate it. They no. couldn't, because it wasn't me being like, because I would, like, oh, I'm sorry. It's like, oh, you're fine. It's like, oh, I just don't want to, you know? Okay. Um, that just kind of, I'm trying to give a small example of how the holiness of, of God affects even the unbeliever, affects the actual space. The, these energies of God affect the space around us, right? And that's one of the big debates right now. You'll have people who will be like, oh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, you'll have these people just like, well, you know, they'll just, they'll poo-poo the, the reality of, of the energies of God and how, how that affects and, and how it affects the, the world and reality around us. What do you mean by that? Like, how do they deny it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, we already alienated boomers and people yeah, yeah, science, yeah, yeah, so yeah, let's yeah, go for yeah. a third one. I mean, well, look, I, I'll, I'll give an example for from today. Yeah. That, you know, I, I they made Superman gay. Now, I'm not going to make a Superman's I'm not son. Trying, Superman's son. But he's the new Superman. He's the new Superman. All right. Okay. We'll see how long that lasts. So, so I'm, well, but this is what I'm saying is that it's like, the subtle i understand exactly what father's saying here like it is the subtle and especially because i played around a lot with this when i was on like when i was on tv it's played around subtly like if i wear this piece of jewelry if i wear i was very particular about like okay we're gonna do this i'm gonna wear this piece of clothing this jewelry, even knowing that it's only subtly going to be in the background of somebody's consciousness as they're watching this thing, right? That it's, but it's, but we perceive the, these things of power. We perceive these things of power. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh, they made Superman gay. And it's just like, oh, well, oh, it's about time, like politically correct. And there's nothing wrong with that and all of that. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like, that's a big change. Mm -hmm. That's like, really it's superman mm -hmm. like that's whether you read comics whether you know anything about the lore of superman whether you know anything like this like it's had a deep and lasting effect on the culture and people involved in the culture for generations and when you make a change like this like it's like you're it's it's an alteration to an icon Mm -hmm. you know and it's like this this is i get this mm -hmm. i i get this in a in a really big way that this is and this is the revelation like this is this is these things have been revealed to us because it's like well where did superman come from like why are all of the things that made superman superman like how does that even come into being the same thing with the changes they made to star wars and all of these things you're like well is it just a story? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or is something trying to be revealed through this art that's happening? Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and I think this is one of the things that um, a lot of people who are waking up and, and finding interest in, in the ancient church and orthodoxy, this is what they're waking up to. Maybe not to the degree that they're going to articulate it like this, but they can sense something's been uncovered, something that they didn't necessarily perceive. And what it is, is this, um, there's this kind of like, I, I don't even know if I may be able to, to articulate myself correctly here because I, there, there's a shift that happened where it's like, 
um, you can subtly move something, but there's a threshold by which the, it's, it's not possible to, to maintain the level of subtlety. It's like the shift from, pers per, from perspective of one angle to another is like, I'm not noticing, I'm not noticing, and all of a second, whoa, what is that, right? The thing's been moving the whole time. The needle's been moving the whole time, whatever's been moving all the whole time, but there's, there's this threshold by which it, cr it, it crosses and it's like, it catches your attention that there's been a change. The change has already been happening, but that threshold is crossed where it's just like something, it catches your attention. And I, that's kind of a crude, I'm sure there's some sort of technical term that describes the phenomenon I'm trying to get across. But the point being, I think you guys are following me, I hope you are, is that- I am. There, like there was a global, shift in 2020 which on the one hand was a culmination of centuries of subtle movements generations of subtle movements that none of the parts are all the parts matter on this one right so in other words perfect storm however you want to look at it the problem with perfect storm is there's a measure of chance with that statement. And it wasn't perfect storm in this regard. This is prophecy, if you will, right? The fact that people are able to be so interconnected, right? We can speculate, we can say in the time of Atlantis, uh, you know, people had worldwide, I, I don't really care in, in, the, in the regards of like, it's all speculation, right? What we know is this and no, time of recorded history has there been a level of global interconnection and seeming omniscience that's the thing that people don't understand is that there is a level of of a, of a seemingly omniscient capability that everyone has now we don't know of a time like this ever in history but it's filtered though it's not my omniscience right like i have yeah. to engage with a power yes that i don't that it's like well but what is this power that i'm engaging with yes. that's making the decision of what I, is going to come through me and that's why i say seemingly because it again antichrist it's in the place of it's this trying to give the things of god without god right the, this is this is what's happened and when you begin to understand, I mean, you know, the book of Enoch is really instructive if you if you read it and you can get you can begin to get an insight of how the powers now answering I'm still on your question, Andrew. We're gonna we're gonna size up now, right? Now let's hopefully there's been some degree of kind of grasping what I'm saying on an individual level, let's size up now and begin to understand how things like influence via technology are really not what people think it is, right? It isn't just a simple matter of, right, getting into the live scientism. Man discovered how transistors work and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't, that's not what happened. That, that's not what happened. And someone goes like, well, what do you mean, blah, blah, blah. I go like, do you know anything about Newton? Do, do you know, do you know anything personally about Newton and where, where, you know, where he understood, we're all, you know, Pythagoras, where they all understood their understanding to come from, right? Any, any innovate, Jack Parsons, the father of the U.S. rocket program, he admitted, he was like, oh no, we're calling demons. Like yeah. these demons told me how to, how to build rockets. It's, it's just yeah. st straight up. <laughs> yep, straight up the founder of jpl that's the founder of the jet propulsion laboratory jack parsons he straight, straight up said straight it up. straight up and so i mean this gets us back to maybe you know hopefully this isn't a stretch but this gets us back to deuteronomy 29 and the lack of humility is what keeps people going like oh that's crazy no that's crazy it's all us it's all us discovering everything and it's all us making it happen it's like 
you know, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna use a word here, so forgive me. I'm, I'm sure someone's wanted to pull my priest card any day here, but I mean this literally, you know, these people who are like, oh, that's all us and science and it's blah, blah, blah. And, and you're just being superstitious and blah, blah, blah. You're a damn fool. Like in the, in the literal sense, you are a damn fool if you think that there has been no influence, there has been no, I mean, I mean, the demonic forces have always loved to watch man choke and, 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 and writhe in our own, you know, our own filth and blood. Like that's, that's, they, they get the most joy out of that because they hate, they, people don't understand not only do they hate us, they hate God. And how do you get at God, but by hurting, you know, his creation, hurting, striking him directly at his throne, which is the heart of man, right? Like, so if you begin to understand cultures and, and nations, right? So, um, you know, an individual person representing can be a representative of a nation, like a king, right? you understand that then you can begin to understand how by you know in the same way and, and again i know i'm going to get all kinds of people who are going to correct me like i can hear the keyboards clacking whatever but you know the czar like czar nicholas right i mean however you want to cut it i get it people want to have their own well actually you know the czar's failed economic policies drove the peasants to like yes that's fine, and I, and I get all that. But the point being is that when you sever a country from its direct connection from to God, well, you look at Russia and the incoming Soviet Union. That's an, that's exactly what happens, right? Nature abhors a vacuum, right? The godlessness that came in is possible because of the regicide. How I that one hundred percent. Absolutely you know, I, no I, doubt about it. Yeah, there's some sophisto, again, forgive me for being, you know, for being salty tonight. There's some sophisto who's going to roll his eyes at that, but I only say that because I'm repenting of it, and I used to be that sophisto who rolled my eyes at it too, right? I understand the perspective. I understand the perspective of wanting to have a critical approach to history, but the problem with that is, is those who are seeking to have that kind of critical approach to history it's it's manufactured and it's psychological and it's limited right when you humble yourself and it's counterproductive it's counterproductive what do you what do you get you get nothing a little ego boost <laughs> if, a little ego mean, boost if that if that so so i mean th this is this is the thing in regards to beginning to understand what's happened and how these principalities work because um it's incredible that on the one hand, a single man can intercede for a nation and God will hear him, right? Um, but on the other hand, it's frightening to think that if there is no man interceding, what is, what is to be made of the people, right? I think when you said, like, what's just, I wanna say this and I wanna iter like, iter reiterate it because I, at the beginning of this, you said, we are the bridge. But what, what I'm keep hearing is like, we're talking about a literal bridge. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the powers and principalities are literally moving through us. Like we, we're, we're the, the fast. Gate. Yeah, exactly. We're, that's the thing people don't understand. We're the Stargate, right? And, and again, uh, <laughs> as crazy as it sounds, it's like, if you actually just put the time and effort to really believe something and actually do it, one way or the other, hot or cold, dark or light, right? You'll you'll see. That's all. That's all I'll say. You'll see. The ones who are like, oh, rolling their eyes, it's because they're lukewarm and they're soft in that sense. They don't. They they just they play with evil, but they're too lazy and too soft to really get in it. Or they play with the holiness of God, but they're too soft and lazy to get in it. The hot or cold is what you got to do. The lukewarm won't cut it. And so if you don't experience, if you haven't 
If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you don't know what we're talking about, that's, I submit, that's probably a big part of it, right? Like, if you want to access those things in, the, in regards to the darkness, then you have to be ready to do dirt. There's no other way. Reading a book, reading Crowley, doing some drugs, you know, that's not enough. That's, that's not enough. There's a reason why he had, there's a reason why there's such levels of horrendous debauchery and just there's inhuman, right? There's a reason for those things being necessary. Conversely, right? Or according, I guess I should say, I don't know whichever one. When someone approaches orthodoxy, and I see this all the time, like if, you, if you're approaching orthodoxy because it's just the historical church, you're not going to get it. Mm-hmm. You're not, you're, you are not going to get it. If you're approaching orthodoxy just because it's the church that for now, you know, depending on where you're at, is it, you know, doesn't put up with gays or whatever, you're not going to get it. That's not, that's, that's not enough. It's not enough because it's the more conservative political, that's, that's not enough. You're not going to get it. You have to die, period. You have to repent. You have to be able to face yourself and say, I am a hypocrite. I am a whoremonger. I am a murderer. I am a thief. You have to be able to go there, period. There's no if, ands, or buts. Because repentance is not just regenerative. It's transformative. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just bring you to this place of like, no longer doing bad things, it puts you on the pathway to becoming holy, right? And so that requires asceticism, period. And to what whatever is asceticism? Degree. Sorry, for a broad, a broad sense of sure, what is asceticism sure, really quickly. Sure. I guess one way, I guess for the, the, the best way to put it in this context is asceticism is the practice of denying oneself for the the hope and the intention of purification to encounter the the grace of god sure right that can be everything from fasting on wednesdays and fridays to doing prostrations Mm -hmm. to making an honest confession like a painfully brutal honest confession right for some people that's an act of asceticism i know some people like scratching their heads but i'm telling you like I've seen some people where it's just like, I'm in so awe I'm that they were able to confess the way they were, right? That, that took, you could physically feel it in them, right? So, but that's what it requires. But here's the great thing. If you do that, you can become all aflame. You can, you can, not, you, not just simply, you, you can, you will. That, that, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that out there. There's no way that you can actually get in it and get after it in the right way with humility, with guidance, in the confines of the church as the Lord has ordained it within that hierarchy. There's no way you can get after it truly and not be changed. It's impossible. It's impossible, right? Think of these stories in the, of the saints, of the jester who mocking baptism is like oh i'm a christian and like and and by the third time he you know dunks himself he's like oh i really am a christian and the emperor's and the king's like oh okay it's not funny anymore he's like no really he's like it's not funny and no no really i'm a christian okay and he's martyred right you 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 <laughs> that really happened too that 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 really happened let me tell you let me tell you a great story um Sandor Tudor, uh, forgive me, I think I butchered his first, his first name. But he's one of the founding members of the uh, Burning Bush Brotherhood, which was a, a movement in Romania. And he started out as a kind of investigative journalist, right? And he wanted to know like, what's this all about? Blah, 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 he goes to Matt Athos. And he goes there as, uh, you know, kind of like a journalist, right? Shorts and just, you know, just a guy, backpack, cropped hair, whatever, a Romanian guy. And he, he gets to Athos and he encounters this pilgrim, 
right? You know, Pilgrim who's on Athos, he's there. And he basically, long story short, he talks to me and says like, look, do you really want to get the scoop of what's going on here in Athos, whatever? And he's like, yeah. He's like, okay, if you do, then you need to do everything I do, do as I do it, do as I say, and then you'll, you'll get the real scoop, right? It's like, okay, great. So he's like, you got to get rid of your shorts, got to wear pants, got to grow out your beard, grow out your hair, and, and follow me and do as I do. So he does that, spends the time whenever he starts engaging the different monasteries in Kelia, the, the different um, communities piously, you know, guys making multiple prostrations, venerating all the icons in the church. And um, he starts doing it, following Sue. And he talks about, soon he noticed that before where, you know, he'd be able to be at a liturgy here or there. Some people talk to him, blah, blah, blah. He started noticing that, uh, you know, doors were opening, literal doors were opening that he didn't notice were there before. You know, monks are popping their heads out and saying like, of the pilgrim, whatever his name is, like he's brought another, look at the pious pilgrim with him, you know, and started saying like, come here and like allowing him to venerate certain relics and, and bringing him to certain services that weren't open to the quote unquote tourists. And over time, take in mind, he, he wasn't a believer really. Over time, he began to, to go through this process of praying, being in all night vigils, prostrations, pi piety, right? He began to have his heart transformed. He talks about this one point in which he was really at this crossroads and an elder had come to him and I think noetically discerned that something was troubling him. And he says to him, it's like, you know, the, the monks are praying like three in the morning and he's like, what were you doing in the world at this time? What kind of like filthiness were you doing in the world, right? Cause he was a party playboy guy, right? And he says, while you were doing that in the world, all of Athos was alive praying. And he says that at this moment, he could just, he had a vision of just all the monks just praying at night, you know, in the middle of the night, interceding for the world, interceding for the love of the world and God hearing them. This man who was once, I think fair to say, at probably one point in time, at the very least, apathetic to God, if not a mocker, he ended up becoming a monastic and eventually was martyred by the communist regime in Romania. Hmm. See, this, this is what I mean by you can't actually get after it and not be changed. And anyone who would tell you otherwise, run from them because they want to sell you something that is worthless, without salt. This is important to understand because in regards to the level of the principalities, the sizing up, that's God's response. He chooses us to be that bridge for him to bring mercy, for him to stay his hand, for him to, in some regards, stay engaged with the world right? Through the love of, 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 of his children and his people, right? And that's, that's the power. It's, it's the one thing I would say to here, it's important that people understand the devil is not the opposite of God. And it's not like God is at, in this kind of like combat with the devils. Like, I don't know if I'm going to pull it out on this one, Jim, you know what I mean? Like that's, <laughs> That's not happening. It's a completely different structure. Um, and it's a little bit of a mind bender, but when you realize that the devils do the bidding of God anyways, that's when you start it. And again, I'm ruining some people right now because they're not in a place to hear what I'm telling them right now. So forgive me, podcast land, but I, when I tell you that um, one, of the, one of the great joys of being 
in a place to where you are actively trying to humble yourself and submit yourself to the will of God, you'll find that even the devils will serve you. Because when they seek to undermine the will of God in your life, when they seek to tempt you, when they seek to destroy you, even that brings about God's will for you to be purified, for you to be strengthened, for you to become something greater than yourself now. So the machinations of the devils and the principalities now is very real, more real than people realize. But ultimately, and this is kind of touching on something that Cyprian was saying, but in a different way is there's a, few, there's, a, there's a certain measure of it being futile that people don't realize. And I don't mean that in the sense of nothing matters and nihilism and just give up, you know, let's just kind of like party and die. There's a certain t- type of futility, meaning that people don't realize that all this is happening because God's allowed it to happen. And, and God's good purposes are going to be brought forth in the end, right? This is where you start to begin to understand St. Sarah from Rose. He said, he asked his spiritual father, St. John Maxwell, he says, Blessed Sarah from Rose. <laughs> I mean, we all know, but yeah, yeah, we yeah, want, yeah. We want <laughs> what we want comes forgive through. Me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Um, so he says, when is the end of the world coming? You know, And uh, St. John Maximovich goes on to tell him some stuff, whatever. But he, he says, essentially, yes, the gospels, you know, Father Severino was like, well, the gospel's been preached all the world, blah, blah, blah. And St. John Maxwell says like, yes, a gospel has been preached all over the world, but not the Orthodox gospel. Mm -hmm. And then he proceeds to quote John and says, those who endure endure to the end will be saved. See, that's the gospel. That's the Orthodox gospel. That's the other part of it is that God became man so man became God and that those who endure to the end, they'll be saved. That's, if I, like, maybe put those two together and like, there you go. So this understanding of enduring to the end, why? Is it a matter of we become these kind of existential um, masochists? No, it's because God is wise and he's the great artificer. He is bringing about the wine to its fruition, my friend. And he is gonna tread the wine press of grief very soon. And even now as he presses, he knows how to age the wine. He knows just when it's time and the trials that believers and good people because there's both there's people who are good people but they're not believers yet and they will soon become this is all part of what they need to do and need to go through to become those believers i wouldn't change the last two years for anything Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank god thank god because it's like i tell my papadia finally we're not crazy this is this is what we've been waiting for. We've been we were made for this, right? Finally, this is this is reality. This is this is what's real. Everything else prior to this was the kind of like, man, this is kind of took us out of our like most like postmodern like ennui we had for like, you know, that I was like born and raised with to be like, oh wait, no, this is still happening. All right, cool. Yeah. Let's go back I mean. Thing. We all know it, but it, it, it it's kind of weird. Maybe one of these days we could talk about like, it's such a tried or tired trope to some degree, but there's another side of it, which I'd like to explore sometime in regards of like the matrix, right? Cause like the matrix yeah. analogy is so good, but there's a part where I've been thinking about lately. I'm like, it's almost too good. You know what I mean? There's, it's almost too good in the sense that like, People wake up and they see this thing. I mean, we even have like the, the term red pills and all that comes from it, right? But there's another side to it that I, I've been, I've just been looking at. I don't, I don't know quite what to make of it, but there's, there's the sense that um, that kind of matrix within the matrix is I think what we're all, what a lot of people are starting to need to wake up to because it isn't simply enough to realize like, okay, this is all, um, this has all been fake and what we're experiencing now is a real thing, um, which again gets us to like the real path. Like, 
I'm watching for that other thing, that other shoe to drop. I'm watching for that, okay, those of us who, are, who want to resist, those of us who are calling out like all the, the tyranny and all that stuff, I'm like, that's good, but this isn't it. Mm -hmm. There's something else coming. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm worried about because yep. the obviousness of all of this is exactly that. It's obvious, right? It's this other thing that's coming, which everyone who's quote unquote, uh, red pilled, <laughs> red pilled they're, yeah. this is, they're blind to it right now. They're, they're blind to, it. we talked about this before, right? It's like the same people, you know, we're bringing it up again, but this is this plays in the principalities that people like Trump. Yeah, Trump was the anti hero. Trump was, yeah, but Trump was pushing the jabs yeah. too. Operation yeah. Warp Speed. Operation he's the one who Warp got it. He's Speed. the one who got him here the fastest. You know what I mean? And uh, I'm sure if we dig into it, there's lots of other things that like, so that's, that's what I mean. It's like, it's too black hat, white hat to some degree. And I, and that's to me, what's going to be fascinating, not just for us to discuss now or later, but as this begins to unfold, because that's what we're all trying to do is just like, start chewing on that, like what's going on? Because again, forgive me getting back to what I talked about with like the whole thing's broken. That's where that starts to apply. Because if you start saying, well, we just need to get more conservative legislators in there. We just need to get, better blah 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 in there it's like no that's not going I'll to see do the it. brass of the titanic it's all going down it's all going down it's all going down so the so the question is is like and i see people's frustration like okay great but like i gotta do something and i'm like yes you do uh you have to start repenting you have Sorry. to start doing the work of becoming not that thing that's been a part of the problem actively right you have to stop being lazy and do the hard work of being uncomfortable with being on the edge, right? Because again, I, again for, for me, that's the thing about the real path is that it's the hardest thing ever. It's so easy to pick a camp and to just become a, a, a party player, you know, a company man, right? I, that's not, if you don't understand that, that that's not where this is at right now, Trust me, just ask yourself, am I really in the right space? Whatever your context is, because there's, there's people who find themselves like, and I, I get it, we need to be with others of like mind, but it's so important that when we find, when, when we're in an arc, when you're in a local arc, it's important that when you're there, that you do the work of trying to not be in an echo chamber yourself. Yeah. Because you have to assume, that everyone around you who you love and who you trust, you have to assume that maybe they're not the one, maybe they're not able to do the work of, you know, testing and, and checking the echo chamber. Yeah. So you have to be the one that's going to do it, right? So, it, and hopefully others will take note. And then if enough people are like making sure we're in an echo chamber, then there's a measure of kind of that paradox of having some degree of kind of like security, right? It's kind of paradoxical. But the security is in being perpetually uncomfortable, if that makes sense. That's how you know from my perspective that you haven't just fallen into the laziness of like picking a camp or picking a side in that sense, because very quickly things can turn. Well, and we've become whole, right? At that point, we're at that point, it's fractal. So it's like, okay, we've it's not just this one little tiny piece of something. It's the it's the whole of everything that like we're we're looking at the end the entirety of it we're not just seeking to have our biases confirmed right our existing biases and that we're like okay let's build from out of here let's let's survive from out of here yeah it's a little bit masturbatory to just like want to go and like have someone just like confirm what you believe and so you guys there's can, a lot like, there's a lot of that it. there's a lot of that now mm -hmm. yeah so guys we're at we're at two hours oh okay <laughs> all right um well, okay, I'm going to do this one because I think I'm always hungry by the end of this. So it's okay. always going to be kind of food. It's always food. <laughs> but yeah. Um, uh, 
Yeah, I'm just going to say, okay, what's your guys' favorite food? Like your favorite meal, like right now, you go pick it up, like restaurant, sushi. any restaurant, any time in your life, like sushi. just one particular thing. What? Sushi. Sashimi. sashimi. It's a good, good sashimi platter. Three meals a day, seven days a week. You got me. I'm For good. real? Yeah. <laughs> That's not a bad answer. <laughs> what about you, Father? Shwarma. Ooh. I could eat it Ooh. every day, all yeah, day. That's that's a good pick. And never never tire of it. As long as I got my onions, some hummus. That's a good pick. I every day, all day. Didn't yeah, you still good. have like some out of this world pastry or something from Mother Earth that you've like talked about before? Oh man. <laughs> yeah. They had this goat cheese. A, it was like a goat cheese apricot i've had that whatever that oh, is i've had that man it's really good and the other thing is here's man there's a local ice cream joint here that had goat cheese apricot ice cream yeah, yeah. oh man. is it like a is it like a persian ice cream place no it's actually no. owned by a mason <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, well, you we just killed. You out. just killed it now. Father can't go back. <laughs> you, you killed hey, it. You killed hey, it for him. No, no. Listen, listen. <laughs> you did kill it because, for you conscience' sake, that, all things are the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You know? <laughs> like, Especially I mean, when it comes to goat cheese, apricot ice cream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pretty phenomenal ice cream. It's incredible. Well, Andrew, what's yours? I mean, dude, I'm from the Southern Midwest. I don't know if you've heard this little joint called Chewy's Mexican mm -hmm. restaurant, but they have the most uh, absolutely amazing nachos. And nachos. At this very moment, they sound pretty amazing. But overall, it's always going to be chips and salsa. Like, that's just yep. my favorite. My, that's a go-to like, for my, me. My primo strategy is every time I go to, like, a Hispanic restaurant, I fill up on chips and salsa. I eat like half of the food I order and then I take, take the rest over. of it home because then you know it's like Hispanic food. So it's only going to get better as it it's sits better. in the fridge. Yep. And you take it out for lunch the next day and you eat it. And it's like those cheesy enchiladas are just amazing once they've been marinating. And you like, guys are making me, I got to go eat now. I'm you pretty guys, hungry. It's, lunch, it's lunchtime. I think by the end of this, every time I'm just kind of hungry. <laughs> so last time it was ketchup and eggs and whatever else I talked about. But, um, and then always like, um, I'm not really a sweets guy, but like, honestly, my wife is like, your idea of like a birthday cake would be like a, just a giant burrito that you could just like cut up and serve in sections to people because it's like, that's what I would want every time. It's just like, cake is fine. <laughs> sweets are cool, not a huge deal. I'm much more of a savory dude. Like my son's the same way. Like my son, like absolutely will like push like, whatever dessert aside to get like more french fries or something while well, my daughter is like a little hummingbird she like flies down and eats some sugar then flies away and, like, <laughs> like that's literally like what louise does so um so uh the last thing i'll say is that uh cyprian and i talked about we're going to start working on a contact page yep. um we talked about it before the recording so we're going to more news about that if you guys want to be able to reach out to us in the meantime if there's any questions or comments or anything like that, um, the comment section on YouTube is a okay. For and now, but we are we are anticipating our cancellation uh, even now. So <laughs> yeah, those people, yeah, those people who have been taking it, taking and watching on the IPFS link, and already we have people who are using the inter interplanetary file system to to pin and back up the this content. Um, right. Thank you, thank so you to everybody doing that. So it can't, can't be taken down. down. And we'll talk more about this as it happens, but already organically people are doing it. So uh, it's wonderful. Thank you to all of you who are doing that. And I think that like before too long, I think we, I think Cyprian probably has a video explaining how to do it. I do. Okay. No, I do. Okay. So then maybe we could find a way to link that or. Yep. I'll link it. Out to people. So I'll link it. The more people get involved, the cooler it is. We're like a really cool band. Come buy our merch or at least stream our music or something like that. So. Um, Anyway, so I still don't have an intro or an introduction. So uh, we'll just say thanks for listening or watching. And we'll, uh, God willing, we'll see you next week.